Listen, I'll say this. If you're a metal band or a rock band, punk band, and your t-shirts are in like Forever 21 or H&M, I think there's a good chance a pop artist might cover your song. Welcome back to another episode of Last Words on the Pit. And we're privileged today to have Aaron Nordstrom. Every time I, I, I say that now, I'm just going to think of fancy shopping right now. Um, from Gemini Syndrome. That's me. Today, we're going to talk about the contentious at times relationship between metal and hard rock and where you draw that delineation, right? Um, Metallica, I'm actually repping my... <laughs> my shirt here today, um, you know, had a little bit of controversy because they had a bunch of pop stars and very notable uh, musical legends, let's put it that way, cover a bunch of their tunes, kind of opened a bit of a door for the conversation. Is that cool? Is that not cool? It does it degradate the, the quality of the metalness of what Metallica is. Um, what do you think about that? I mean, the line between hard rock and metal, first of all, is like, just such a gray area right because even within metal we have like a thousand categories of it and some people probably don't consider some of those to really be metal so you're really you're, you're talking about differences of opinion that are so spread out and overlapped that like where can you draw a line right as far as metallica they can do anything they want at this point right who's to tell them who's to tell them otherwise but i get it like we want metal to be our thing right and it's like an exclusive club. I get that. But also at the same time, like it's really easy to exclude other cool stuff when you do that. You know, we've had some of this stuff. I mean, I believe it's Metal Hammer or Kerrang. One of the UK magazines, sorry if I'm getting it wrong, has done a lot of these tribute uh, tributes to Master of Puppets and tributes to the Black Album and Iron Maiden. And so you, you, we have a history of metal bands doing Metallica. But I think in a lot of instances, those bands are almost being set up for failure because it's kind of hard to do Master of Puppets as a metal song better than Metallica. It's hard to do uh, some of, you know, Sad But True as a metal song, maybe better than Metallica. So I, I think, A, it, it, it lends to the idea that Metallica is kind of bigger than metal, that their legacy allows them to reach these indie artists and pop artists and country artists and, and things that it just speaks that their influence is just it's it's pervasive in many ways i'd rather hear the songs completely reinterpreted in different ways as opposed to trying to kind of make a copy of a copy that feels derivative and it doesn't mean it won't be good because i've heard great covers of metallica whether it's trivium or machine head uh, or bands like that. So I, I think it's it's exciting, uh, even without even knowing how good it is. But I'm sure there's got to be a few gems in there. At least there's 52 damn covers. Oof. Sheesh. <laughs> I think, honestly, it speaks to their songwriting, right? Like, you're not seeing Elton John covering Slayer, by the way. <laughs> like but he you're, could. There... But he could. But he, he could. could. He could. Elton John rips, okay? Um, but I definitely think it speaks to songwriting. When I was actually listening to the cover... Like, it's nothing new. There's been pop artists that have covered Metallica plenty of times. And like, first of all, Miley Cyrus is an amazing vocalist. Like, I don't care what anybody says. Her voice is like one of the actually most pure rock voices we've heard in pop music in a very long time. On the converse of that, metal, metal and hard rock bands tend to cover, you know, uh, out of genre tunes all the time. So it's kind of an homage going the opposite direction, right? Alien Ant Farm? That was, you just read my mind. <laughs> Obvi yeah, oddly enough. I don't know if they're a metal band, but. Doc is uh, an MJ lover. What's your tune on that? Yeah, I mean, it's, listen, it's, it's, it's as a band, you know, my band Bad Wolves that got their career launch uh, from a cover of, a, of an alternative song. I mean, it, it goes back to even the 90s with Limp Bizkit getting their break with uh, Faith and mm -hmm. Marilyn Manson getting his break with Sweet Dreams, Orgy with Blue Monday. I mean, you can kind of go down the line. It, to some degree, it became a, a bit of a trope. Typo but negative on every record. <laughs> there is that idea of reimagining. And, and I'm, I'm always for it as long as it feels fresh. I mean, listen, we've, we've heard a lot of songs get butchered <laughs> throughout the years. A lot of certain ones like, eh. I don't know about that. But. Enjoy the silence, the 90 times that somebody's trying to do it justice and it rarely sounds good. <laughs> 
What an intimidating band to cover. I love them so much. There's just no way. <laughs> I want to do Stripped someday. That's like, ooh, that's favorite. a good one. I think that'd be a cool rock tune somehow, but we'll see. Listen, I'll say this if you're a metal band or a rock band, punk band, and your t shirts are in like Forever 21 or HM, I think there's a good chance a pop artist might cover your song. And you're making money. <laughs> like Metallica's done a ton of covers themselves, like from the Misfits to, I don't know, what was it, Bob Seeger? Like, or was it Bob Seeger? Um, mm-hmm. Turn the Page, the, uh-huh. the OG. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like Metallica's covered a bunch of people too when it was a good song. Good song is a good song. Metallica in the 90s, right? Got a lot of flack for obviously doing a little bit more accessible radio hits at a time too where rock radio was super, super strong and really, um, you know, helped to sell units, right? For lack of a better way to put it. What do you think is that threshold? Like I, I live in the active rock world technically, <laughs> right? So it's a, man, I don't know. Depends how, depends how hard, yeah, if you don't scream once. Or, uh, yeah, a good melody is always a, a, tr- uh, a trick to know that they sold out for sure. Well, listen, I, I, I think the late 90s is a great time period to examine how you eventually ended up with the radio rock environment we have now. So you had the kind of end of grunge, which they call post-grunge, right? And out of that came the creeds and the days of the new and hootie and stuff like that. And then you had new metal kind of coming up and disturbed and Lincoln Park and all that stuff happening. And then within that, you had Metallica, I think, trying to essentially, I think, be relevant and also grow, right? To me, so me, when I hear load, I don't hear radio rock or I don't hear pop. I just, I hear like blue, they went blues and they went hard rock, but it still feels like Metallica. It just, you know, it feels like the, the most rock oriented version of the black album with a rock production, right? It's not, doesn't sound quite as metal. James isn't gritting up his vocals quite as much, but it still feels like Metallica. And I think even unless you're just a hardliner, right? There's those, some fans who they don't like anything except Injustice for All and Before. That's what I'm saying. There's, there's people like that, right? But I remember specifically when Load came out and there was a, there was a, a, a some, it was a documentary, I think, and they were talking to Kirk and he's like, I just really wanted to focus on my blues playing. And that's what I did on this album. And even as a kid that came out like way back in the day. Right. And as a kid and a guitar player, I was kind of one of those hardliners when I was in my teens. Right. Like I only listened to black metal and Metallica and Megadeth. Now that I'm older, like I play guitar and I've really been getting into blues and more jazzy kind of stuff. So I can understand that at that point they'd been doing that stuff for 20 years. We want to, you want to go and experiment and become a better player and a better songwriter. And I totally get that. And to your point, it's an evolution of your playing, right? Sure. What's your thoughts on melody and how hard melody actually is? Do you think it's harder to do stuff that's a little, just a bit more fast and proficient, or is it harder to really write a killer melody? The hardest thing with melody is to come up with something unique, right? Mm-hmm. Because if, if you know, everyone's using the same, I'm going from G to C to D in every song. So how do you stand out? You know, mm-hmm. and, and and especially when, you know, and difference, you know, I come from a band like God Forbid, my old band, which was a lot heavier, a lot more screaming. When you have to write with Bad Wolves, where we had whole song, most of the songs are clean, are sung with melody. You have the, the melody, the vocal melody is right, like writing a new song on top of the song. <laughs> like, so you have to write the song twice. And it's, it's like putting a, an impossible puzzle together. You know, and it's uh, I think it's extremely challenging. And but 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 I don't think that undermines other things, because I think now uh, harsh vocals are essentially it's almost a rhythmic instrument. Right. You're writing patterns, you're writing syn- syncopation, you're writing kind of the bouncing ball. And that that's you know to do that. Well, I think it's almost an underrated skill as well, like finding that that stuff that hits almost like a rapper. Right. Finding those pockets of groove and and hook with with harsh vocals as well. Man, you're good at this podcast thing. <laughs> he knows all the right words, right? I couldn't agree more though. Let me let me tack onto that because music is composed of three elements, rhythm, melody, and harmony. And that's really at its core, that's what it is. So you're absolutely right when it comes to screaming, especially as as, as it's evolved like Corey Taylor, 
uh, Chad Gray and Mudvayne did, a, and, and in Hell Yeah too, does a lot of really fast, rappy kind of stuff, right? Jens from Meshuggah is really just a rhythmic instrument. But the cool thing about screaming and singing combined or, or using either one is that the vocal is, a, is, a, is the means of conveying a message or a story. So whatever tool you're using in that, in that particular place in the throat, like you get to convey a feeling or an emotion and something that other instruments don't have the capacity to do, like the human voice. Right. So you get to use that however you want. I think melody is, ne is necessary, at least in, in the things that I like to hear. But I love screaming, too. Right. When it's used like just like a chainsaw in the middle of the song to to express that kind of angst or anger or intensity or whatever it might be. But that's just another tool in the, in the wheelhouse. Right. <laughs> I want to ask you something, because, you know, in many ways, you know, I come from an extreme metal background and then I joined this band that ultimately became a band that did well at Active Rock Radio. So sure. now it's just something that's part of the repertoire that, that the band does. You've been doing, you've been in that world for basically the whole time of, of this band. Is it, is it something for you guys where you're working on a song and maybe, you know, you send a demo to the label or they hear a version of it in there there are kind of maybe like edits or limitations or like this idea of trying to fit something for the format. Uh, yeah. At times, unfortunately, like those, those things go back and forth. And sometimes <sighs> there's this philosopher called Alan Watts. If you're not familiar, you should look oh, him yeah. up. He's like, Alan yeah. Watts talks about how everything is a game. And when somebody comes to you and is like, well, this, uh, we need this to be more like this. And you're like, your initial reaction is to give him the finger and be like, that's my song. Right. What I found is that by maybe changing the same thing you did just a little bit in presentation, maybe taking a little bit of the grit out of the vocal, right? Or maybe making, maybe adding one more harmony to it to make it sound a little prettier can kind of traverse those waters, right? But there's for sure been, a, been situations with every record that we've done in this band that like, it's expected that there's going to be, you know, radio songs there's the plan is to go to radio so we have to write at least three tunes with that in mind and the older i've gotten and the further we've come i've realized that that's okay right it gives me it gives me an opportunity to try to write a song that maybe i wouldn't have normally written i get to explore my wheelhouse a little bit and dude i grew up listening to pop music and i grew up playing classical and jazz piano and singing choir stuff and you know, listening to trance music and also listening to black metal and folk music. And you know what I mean? So I, I enjoy the opportunity to just make what we said earlier, a good song is a good song. Right. But I've also found that if you, if you make them the people, the powers that be happy with those songs, then they don't care what the rest of the record sounds like. And you can make it really whatever you want, as long as you hit those home runs and and I don't feel like I'm selling out doing it. Like I said, I'm writing cool songs. I think that I wouldn't put anything on the record that I was like, that's garbage. You know what I mean? I just wouldn't. I would fight, I would fight tooth and nail to not do that. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, you, the, that first Bad Wolves record, you did an excellent job of having really heavy musicality. You didn't lose any of that edge from where you came from. Uh, hats off to you for that. Because the riffs, the riffs are balls man they're awesome they take credit for it <laughs> thank you yeah it's well listen it's um it's a crazy thing because the, the three song idea is something that being on this side of the industry i i hear again and again whether that's from the label or you know even like zoltan from five finger talks about that you know that like the term I, or the, the metaphor they use is that basically your singles are like commercials for your band right there that's like that's great the fish feet, you know, it's like the, the fish bait you put out there to get people to come to your shows, to buy the t-shirt, buy the the meet and greet and all that stuff. And it's I think some coming out of an underground world, it's sometimes a tough pill to swallow, maybe the the commodification of it all. Yeah, man. Yeah. But it is important, right? You need those, you need them those bangers, right? <laughs> yeah, dude. The first the first band I played professionally in was OTEP, and that was anything but a but a commercial radio band. You know, and the musicality of that stuff was insanely heavy. You know, we want to be successful as musicians. And that means getting, getting the commercial analogy is really good, man. That's so true. Just going back to Metallica thing in this box set, like, oh, why are they remastering the album? Why are they doing this? So if people don't know, 
Metallica got back their masters a few years back and they've been doing box sets for all every album. So it just so happens Black Album is, is up for a box set. So don't think it's just some crazy ca cash drive. They're giving a bunch of money to charity and the people want it. The real Metallica fans want the box set with all the demos and the liner notes and all that stuff. So it's a, you know, I'm just, I'm just putting it out there for, you know, the, the, the hater, the haterade drinkers of the world. And they're teaching a new generation of kids who Metallica are in their songs. Damn straight. It's the biggest selling album since 1991. All right, put some respect on their name. <laughs> it still sells like every week, like yeah. mad numbers. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, it is. Aaron, where can people find you on the internet? They can find us at all of the media platforms across social medias, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Everything is backslash Gemini Syndrome. You can also go to GeminiSyndrome.com. Doc, what about you? <laughs> what about me? I'm just, I'm just here for Aaron. Aaron, thank you Bro, so much for being here. I love you. It's good to see you. I miss you out in LA. You know, I know you're I know, man. Now, but uh, I'll see it's you It's cheaper soon. out here, bro. It's cheaper out here. I know, I know, but I can't, I can't live on the, the moon on earth, okay? I'm, a, I'm an albino, so this is the most antithetical place I should be, right. and that's why I'm here. That's right. Meet <laughs> the Oslo or something. So anyway, I just want to wish you the best with your album and your tours and everything. It's just great to see you, brother. Thank you, brother. Likewise, I appreciate being on here. This has uh, been really fun. You can creep me, Zena, on the internet at Zena Koto with two E's. What about you, Doc? You can find me at Doc Coil, Instagram and Twitter. You know where I'm at. Well, that's it for today. We've explored the definition of butt rock quite a ton. If you want to actually hear the whole podcast, listen wherever you get your podcasts.